My name is Glenn Coppola. I am one of the addiction medicine fellows here at the University of Wisconsin. And I'm in the home stretch here. I have uh, just the rest of this month left and then I'll be returning to my position uh, at the Mayo Clinic Health System in Eau Claire. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about less frequently encountered substances of misuse. Uh, a lot of these are substances that we've all heard of, but, but may not encounter too frequently in our practice. And I'm hoping that I'll give you a little bit refresher about the, some of these substances and hopefully increase your uh, knowledge base just a little bit. I have no financial relationships to disclose. If I talk about medications off their FDA indication, it is just for informational purposes only. I'm going to be talking about the pharmacology of these substances, toxidromes and overdose, the treatments of those toxidromes and overdose if one is available. We'll also talk about treatment of uh, dependence and addiction. So the first substance we'll talk about is uh, bath salts. As, as we know, bath salts are a misnomer. Bath salts have actually nothing to do uh, with bathing. Bath salts are, synth are synthetic cathinones. Uh, cathinones in nature occur in a, in a plant called cot. Uh, who's and, and this plant is native to East Africa and Southern Arabia, and the leaves have um, mild uh, stimulant properties. Synthetic cathinones were designated Schedule One by the DEA in 2012. They have been sold in the past to simulate methamphetamine, cocaine, and hallucinogens. It seems that the that uh, products labeled bath salts don't seem to be as common as they once were in the mid 2000s. Now you'll sometimes see them as being uh, represented as MDMA or Molly. One study that I looked at showed that uh, at one rave or um, uh, EDM event, uh, they tested uh, MDMA and Molly there, and 46% of the time it was synthetic cathinones. It has street names as listed there, like bath salts and potpourri. Um, they're often labeled as not for human use. That way they try to bypass federal regulation. Um, it, but those who are looking for it know what names that they're looking for or know what substances they're looking for. Uh, a cursory look on the internet, uh, like on eBay, uh, Google, I, I couldn't find anything that referred to these substances. I'm not sure what, how that represents how available they are currently. Uh, synthetic cathinones can be used oral, nasally, IV, or rectally. Bath salts contain uh, synthetic cathinones. The three main synthetic cathinones are the, th the top three listed there, MDPV, amiferidone, and methylone. Uh, bath salts might contain other constituents as well, such as caffeine and lidocaine. Why trimethoprim? I don't know. I couldn't find any other references to that. Uh, people who use bath salts often have other co-ingestants, which are typical substances of misuse or abuse that we're aware of. And this often confounds uh, um, Toxidrome or clinical presentation of overdoses. They may have drug screens that are positive for these substances, but it's the synthetic cathinone that cathinone that is responsible for their current toxidrome. When I made this slide set a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, what I found in the literature is that is that in standard lab testing, it's it's generally not available, but specialized testing may be av available. But what I found since then is is that there are a number of commercial labs that uh, right or routinely can test for the synthetic cathinones. The rotation that I'm doing currently, they use an outside laboratory company uh, for their uh, urine drug screen confirmations, and they can test for that. So it is routinely available, but uh, in in some other 
um, context, but not currently in our in our hospital context. Fast cell intoxication uh, has some common signs and symptoms: sympathetic activation leading to tachycardia, hypertension, and chest pain. Uh, what you hear about more in the lay press is the or the and also the uh, ER literature is its psychiatric manifestations, agitations. Uh, competitive and violent behavior, hallucinations, and paranoia. Uh, the most worrisome complications uh, of overdose are the neurologic, including seizure and confusion. My my personal experience, and this is anecdotally, it seemed like I saw more cases of synthetic cathinone induced psychosis or hospitalization in the mid 2000s, like. 2005 to 2010. I don't recall seeing a case recently, and I'm not sure if what that represents, if that means that synthetic cathinones have lost some of their popularity uh, and are not as commonly used, or if there's another factor in play there. Overdose of synthetic, synthetic cathinones may lead to seizure, coma, multi-organ failure, and, and interestingly, ischemic colitis has also been reported with overdose. Treatment of intoxication and overdoses is, is symptom targeted. The ER and intensive care literature uh, reports using benzodiazepine, especially lorazepam, to treat agitation and seizures. The current recommendation is that antipsychotics should be used cautiously uh, due to the already lowered seizure threshold uh, that uh, synthetic cathinones can cause. And then also need to always be aware that because of other co-ingestions like opioids, stimulants, uh, that they could confound the clinical picture. I could not find any literature on the pharmacologic treatment of cathinone use disorder. The next substance I want to talk about is spice or uh, and or K2, which is the same thing. I put these two together because spice and bath salts are often mentioned together when I when I look at the uh, lay press and some of the more um, some of the medical literature that's kind of geared toward a general audience. But there are two distinct molecules substances. Spice is a synthetic cannabinoid or cannabinoid analog that is sprayed onto some kind of dried shredded plant material. So the, the plant material is the um, uh, vehicle to carry the synthetic cannabinoid. And, it, and its most common names are uh, spice and K2. Uh, it's also sold as, it might be sold as incense. And again, it could be labeled not for human use. Uh, it could be smoked or made into a tea, most commonly smoked. Uh, synthetic cannabinoids were put into the Schedule 1 as of 2012. And when I look at uh, data regarding patterns of use, the last time I could find mention was in 2013, where they said that 8% uh, of high school seniors and 7.5% of 8th and 10th graders had used synthetic cannabinoids within the last year. Synthetic cannabinoids act on the CB1 and CB2 receptors, but have a much greater affinity and activity than THC. Again, I had this, when I made this slide, I put that it's undetectable in standard uh, laboratory tests, but um, I have found since that time that there are commercial laboratory tests that have the ability to check for at least the metabolites of synthetic cannabinoids. Small doses of synthetic cannabinoids mimic the effects of THC, and this is the exact reason that they're sold. Uh, they're sold to mimic THC or cannabis, but uh, be undetectable in standard drug screens, which we now know that there are a lot of labs where it is detectable. Higher doses of synthetic cannabinoids can cause uh, sympathetic activation, tachyarrhythmias, agitation, tachycardia, anxiety. It could also cause uh, uh, psychiatric manifestations, paranoia, hallucinations, uh, neurologic 
complications such as coma and seizure. Violent agitation, psychosis, and seizures may occur. I think this is the reason why it's often put together or linked to synthetic cathinones because they both have, have this um, potential outcome from overdose. And again, treatment is supportive uh, and may require large doses of benzodiazepines to control agitation and seizure. And again, caution with antipsychotics because uh, synthetic cannabinoids like the synthetic cathinones reduce your seizure threshold. A withdrawal syndrome from synthetic cannabinoids have been reported, including anxiousness, insomnia, and tachycardia. And there have been case reports of treating the withdrawal with a benzodiazepine taper or quetiapine. I could not find any uh, literature or case reports on the pharmacologic treatment of a synthetic cannabinoid use disorder. Since we're moving, since we're talking about the cannabinoids, we'll move from the synthetic to the uh, naturally occurring. I'm just going to touch briefly on Delta-8. Delta-8 seems to have been in the news more recently uh, in Wisconsin because it's technically legal here. And Delta-8 is an isomer of THC that's derived from the hemp plant. It's chemically related to Delta-9, which is from the cannabis plant. When you Google Delta-8 in, the, in, in Madison, there are a few places that do sell Delta-8 products specifically. Like Delta-9, uh, it can be uh, something that can be smoked, vaped, or consumed. Uh, it has similar effects of Delta-9, it's a CB1 agonist causing euphoria, uh, sensory and time distortions, reduced inhibitions, et cetera. At higher levels, causes a, a, a syndrome that you may see with cannabis over in, uh, uh, intoxication or overdoses, anxiety, tachycardia, upset stomach, confusion, hallucinations, et cetera. Uh, the literature in, in discussing uh, Delta-8, I found a couple of case reports where, they, where it was treated similar to a Delta-9 or cannabis use disorder. Dextromethorphan. These are just a couple of the dextromethorphan containing products on the market. There are about 150 products that contain dextromethorphan. Uh, dextromethorphan is uh, primarily used as an antitussive. Dextromethorphan has some common street names. I, I was just looking at some board review information and robo tripping was mentioned as a possible board review question. Um, Robo tripping is a is they that where robo tripping means that people have a, like a almost like a catatonic state where they're walking but seem to uh, be uh, have muscle rigidity and uh, seem to be unresponsive. Dextromethorphan is technically a synthetic opioid that is synthesized from a morphine like base, but it does not have any uh, opioid receptor activity. Dextromethorphan is an uh, NMDA receptor antagonist, and which is similar to ketamine and PCP, and that's responsible for its dissociative effects. When you read about the the chemistry of dextromethorphan, it's how it its antitussive effect or how it how it achieves its antitussive effect is not really known. It was originally developed uh, for potentially for the treatment of um, certain psychiatric disorders, but it never uh, had enough evidence to support that use. Dextromethorphan may also be called um, lean purple drink or dirty Sprite, and that is a combination of dextromethorphan, Sprite, and Jolly Rancher candy. It could also be in place of dextromethorphan, it could also have um, promethazine coating syrup. And this particular combination has some popularity in the hip hop subculture. And there have been reported deaths from, uh, from overdose in some performers. At 
low levels, dextromethorphan causes mild perceptual alterations. Uh, it could also cause impairment of motor, cognitive, and perceptual functioning. At higher levels, hallucinations and disassociation can occur. Uh, at, at overdose, violence and complete dissociation and cardiorespiratory collapse could occur. I took this slide from a World Health Organization paper about dextromethorphan, and they took it from somewhere they found on the internet where there are websites where you can um, dose your dextromethorphan based on the effect that you want. So uh, if you're interested in uh, dissociative sedation, then you could take uh, 500 to 1500 milligrams of uh, dextromethorphan. And when you when you when you Google this and look at the websites, they call this plateaus. So if you're looking to to reach a certain plateau with dextromethorphan, it tells you what the dose what the dose is that you would uh, take for that. A withdrawal syndrome syndrome for dextromethorphan has been described consisting of severe vomiting, muscle aches, and diarrhea within the first weeks of discontinuing use, followed by night sweats and some anxiety that could last up to three weeks. Treatment of overdose and withdrawal is supportive and symptom directed. There have been reports of successful treatment of a dextromethorphan use disorder with naltrexone. Uh, dextromethorphan misuse came to my attention this year as we were asked to see a 66-year-old female in the hospital who was admitted for abdominal pain. And she had a history of alcohol use disorder and bipolar uh, disorder. And in the course of the history taking, she told us that she was taking 15 Mucinex tablets daily, which is about 900 milligrams of dextromethorphan. The, the, the recommended adult dosage, maximum adult dosage is about 120 milligrams. Uh, and she told us that she started using dextromethorphan after she stopped using alcohol about six years prior. And her withdrawal symptoms that we were seeing at that time were a tremor, insomnia, restlessness, and sweating. Dextromethorphan is, uh, in this presentation, one of the two most commonly uh, uh, misused by children and adolescents as it's um, legal and readily and uh, uh, easily obtainable. Some states have a, a limit on the or some pharmacies impose an age limit on who can um, purchase this, but uh, in a lot of places, children can easily, and young people can easily go and purchase dextromethorphan. I went to high school in the mid eighties in rural Northern Michigan. And I remember that Comtrex, which is a dextromethorphan containing agent, um, was a thing for a while that uh, classmates were uh, misusing. I'm just going to talk about COT. Uh, COT, this is pronounced COT, like C-O-T. And what you're looking at here is a suitcase full of COT that was uh, smuggled into the United States. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. COT is a uh, stimulant uh, that has a stimulant effect from the leaves and twigs from an evergreen shrub, that, evergreen shrub that's native to Africa and Arabia. The active ingredients of cot are uh, cathinone and caffeine. Uh, these are the, this is the naturally occurring um, cathinone that uh, bath salts or synthetic cathinones is based on. In the United States, cathinone is schedule one and caffeine is schedule four. Cathinone has, is more psychoactive than caffeine. In countries where cot is used regularly, the leaves and twigs are chewed fresh or dry. The dry leaves can also be brewed into a tea. Um, cot is used often in, in a social setting when people get together simple, similar to what we would ex, uh, see in the United States when people get together uh, and might have a few alcoholic drinks. 
After cot is harvested, it loses the majority of its potency within two days. And the cath the cathone, the cathinone degrades and it's the caffeine that's left and it has milder um, psychoactive properties. It's still popular among uh, some subpopulations, especially the Somali population in the US, where I where I live in the western part of the state in Eau Claire. Um, that's about an hour and a half from, from Minneapolis and there's a large Somali population there. And you sometimes read about uh, caught seizures at the Minneapolis airport. Cathinone and caffeine stimulate the release of serotonin and dopamine, giving the feeling of energy and mild euphoria. It has uh, some adverse effects, including uh, sympathetic activation, tachycardia, palpitations, uh, difficulty breathing. The most common adverse effect is constipation, which may occur in up to 54% of users. It can affect the liver. Uh, it can affect the central nervous system. It may have uh, effects on the embryo. Interestingly, under respiratory system, it says tuberculosis, and I couldn't find any other information uh, regarding that. I just thought that was an interesting finding or an interesting uh, adverse effect. A cot toxidrome has been described with hypertension, tachycardia, as I mentioned before. Uh, constipation is very common and rarely psychosis. Treatment is generally supportive. I, I, I mentioned before that uh, there, there, there weren't uh, uh, lab tests for synthetic cathinones. And um, it turns out that with COT, that caffeine, uh, a caffeine metabolized norephedrine, which may be present up to 40 hours, and, and that might be a way to distinguish a COT overdose from other substances. Physical withdrawal symptoms from chronic COT use include energia, nightmares, and trembling. These may appear several days after ceasing to use. Depression, sedation, and hypotension have also been reported as a withdrawal symptom. Up to a third of regular COT users develop a substance use disorder. Uh, and there are case reports of treating COT use disorder with bromocryptine. I, I couldn't find uh, a source that talked about what the actual physiologic reason is of choosing bromocryptine just that it has been used for the treatment of that. The next substance we'll talk about is phenobut. I was first um, exposed to this uh, just a few months ago when a colleague from the institution where I'm on sabbatical from emailed me a mail about that if I had any information and it, and, it, and it prompted me to really take a closer look at that. Uh, Beta-phenyl GABA or gamma immunobutyric acid was first developed in Russia in the 1960s as an anxiolytic and a treatment for depression. It is most commonly used in Russia today for uh, preoperative uh, anxiety. It has not been improved in the rest of Europe United, or the United States, and it is a controlled uh, substance in Australia. Phenobut in the U.S. is marketed as a nootropic. And nootropics are substances that are marketed to improve cognition, memory, creativity, and motivation. And when I talked to Dr. Mike Miller about this, uh, he said that it's, uh, it's for uh, helping deficits where no deficits, where no deficits exist. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, go off on a slight tangent regarding nootropics overall. Um, other nootropics include prescription medications like armadafinil, which is uh, which is a prescription in the United States. Some of these other substances or medications as paracetam, citicoline, amplicant, and cerebral license are by prescription in other countries. For example, cerebral license is by prescription in Europe and it's given post ischemic stroke to try to improve cognition. Other prescription substances can, could be the stimulants as methylphenidate, listexamphetamine, 
Caffeine is often sold as a nootropic. Other prescription medications such as levodopa, numerous vitamins and herbs are marketed as nootropics such as B-complex vitamin combinations, ginkgo, St. John's wort, kratom and CBD are also marketed as nootropic. I read somewhere that there are about 5,000 products worldwide that are uh, currently sold as nootropics. Phenobut is sold as a nutritional supplement to circumvent the FDA regulation. Some of the names that it has been sold un under are uh, Enbofen, Nufen, and Phenobut. I tried to look on uh, Google and Amazon and uh, eBay, but I couldn't find these trade names. And when you Google Phenobut itself, you usually you usually uh, get a bunch of ads for other nootropics that I talked about, usually combinations of vitamins and herbs. Betalphenyl gamma is a GABA B agonist at usual doses like baclofen, and at higher doses is a GABA A agonist, which are the benzodiazepine receptors. Phenobut use and misuse can result in sedation, respiratory depression, and reduced level of consciousness that you respect with that receptor agonism. Withdrawal symptoms have been reported, including anxiety, agitation, and acute psychosis. Overdose is characterized by altered mental status, somnolence, and unresponsiveness, and we do not have any laboratory tests uh, for uh, but or its metabolites. Phenobut withdrawal independence. Uh, there are some case reports. Of uh, treating with uh, baclofen up to 10 milligrams of baclofen for per 1 milligram of phenobut. There's also been case reports of treating phenobut dependence with phenobarbital. I'm going to stop for a second here and see if there are any questions or comments. I'm just taking a look at the chat here. I got a note that somebody wanted to annotate on here, uh, but then I would lose my screen sharing. <clears throat> my screen sharing ability. So if, if that if that person wanted to comment in the chat, okay, I'm going to move on. I'm just going to touch touch on kratom just briefly. Uh, Mertragena speciosa, the kratom plant, is native to Southeast Asia, and its leaves contain compounds that have psychotropic effects. Kratom can be sold as a pill capsule or an extract like this. Uh, you can chew kratom leaves. Uh, you can brew the dried or powdered leaves as a tea. Uh, they can be smoked or also eaten in food. It seems that what I normally see is that people are taking it in a uh, pill or capsule form. Uh, these are some images that I captured from the internet. Internet on the left there, it's that is CBD infused kratom, and that is sold on a site that advertises for uh, nootropics. The middle and right one are images that I captured from a medical office in Florida where they where they sell. There is a, a documentary on Amazon that about kratom called A Leap of Faith. I didn't watch the documentary, but I did watch the trailer on YouTube. And it from what it looks like from the trailer is that they're promoting or that the documentary promotes Kratom as a quote safer alternative to opioids. And as it says in that description, um, but doesn't carry the deadly side effects, withdrawal symptoms or addiction problems. There are there's another form of Kratom called Mang Da. Mang Da is reported to be a more 
um, powerful uh, or uh, potent form of Kratom. This may be a marketing, uh, just a marketing thing. I tried looking that up a little bit more and couldn't find uh, any other references. But uh, Mangda is, uh, is, seems to be more becoming more common now. It, it might be that the search engines uh, don't recognize that particular word where they might recognize Kratom or maybe websites don't recognize Mangda, but they recognize Kratom. Uh, it's been banned in the United States since 2014, but it is not a controlled substance. It is illegal in six states, including Wisconsin. From Madison, it seems that patients have been driving to either Illinois or Iowa to get their Kratom supply, and I know that some patients have been ordering it online. What I didn't know about Kratom is that mertragenine and 7-alpha-hydroxymertragenine are complex molecules with a number of sites of activity. Um, mertragenine and 7 alpha hydroxymertragenine agonize the immune receptors, causing sedation, sedation and pleasure, and analgesia, similar to other opioids. But they also antagonize the serotonin receptors. They agonize the dopaminergic and uh, noradrenergic receptors, and this is how it. This is then this leads to its stimulant effects. So at low dose, kratom may have an energizing effect as it hits these other receptors at higher doses as it as the new receptors are agonized as you get the euphoria sedation and at very high doses may cause psychosis treatment of of overdose is is generally supportive of no antidotes or antidotes or, or specific treatments uh, uh, i didn't find that in in the literature or any case reports there are case reports of a Kratom use disorder, uh, and these have been successfully successfully treated with buprenorphine, naltrexone, and or methadone. Uh, I I got this particular slide from a recent article in the Wisconsin Medical Journal that was co-authored by uh, Brian Hibke, who is one of my colleagues in the uh, addiction psychiatry program, and will soon be graduating. This is a picture of poppy seeds at the local Woodman's in Madison. Poppy seeds are kept behind the counter there with some other items to their high theft potential. And this is a, a screenshot that I grabbed from an eBay listing for poppy seeds. And, and we'll talk about more about this more in a second, but I just wanted to tell you that it's out there and bitter is the key a key word in this description, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. Uh, poppy seeds are the seeds of the poppy plant Papaver somniferum, or somniferum, uh, and they're a potential source of morphine, codeine, and thebane. The FDA has ruled that the seeds themselves are legal, but the contaminants are not. You can buy poppy seeds to bake with, but the contaminants that may be on the seed coats are illegal. Well, how, how can that be? How do, how do papa seeds end up with the opium alkaloids on them? Well, the seeds themselves do not contain poppy seeds or do not contain the opioid alkaloids. However, depending on the method, method of processing, there could be morphine, codeine, and thebane on the seed coats. And the concentration of those uh, opium alkaloids on the seed coats is highly variable. Uh, it could be for morphine, it could be between between 10 and 105 milligrams per kilogram of seed and um, 3.1 to 11.2 milligrams per kilogram of codeine on the seeds. So how do people, oh, this is a picture of uh, the uh, opium plant and the seeds. How do people get the opium uh, alkaloids from the seeds uh, so that they so that they can ingest it. And the way that they do that is they make a tea. And the tea is actually a supernatant uh, from soaking the seeds in water or or uh, slightly acidifying it, the water with lemon juice or citric acid and shaking it vigorously. Um, 
Poppy seed tea, that supernatant is consumed for the purpose of intoxication or the treatment of pain or anxiety. Uh, used during pregnancy can lead to neonatal abstinence syndrome, and this has been reported. And I tried to find out how frequently uh, poppy seed tea is used. And the, the, only, the only information I could find about that was that at a, at a study done at a treatment facility in New Zealand, 46% of opioid dependent patients reported at, at least one time in the past using poppy CT. I don't know how well that 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 translates into the United States. Maybe uh, maybe it's more commonly used in New Zealand. Uh, this first came to my attention during this year as a 65 uh, year old male who had a history of chronic pain, who had been on chronic opioids from his prescriber, but the, or his PCP, and his PCP had stopped prescribing it. And he did some uh, research on the internet and thought that poppy CT might be a way for him to manage his pain. And he sought assistance from us uh, because he realized he was dependent on it and that he may go through withdrawal and he had a, a desire to discontinue that to the use of it. He was also concerned about the ongoing cost of that. Um, his urine drug screen was positive for morphine, codeine, hydromorphone, hydrocodone, and norhydrocodone, which would all would be expected uh, from his consumption of poppy CT. He consented to uh, medical assisted therapy with suboxone. He, he, uh, he went through a home induction and was stable on eight milligrams daily. Forgot to mention here. The bitter here refers to uh, is kind of a code word for seeds that that are unwashed or unprocessed. When you when you when I did a little bit more digging, the words unprocessed and unharv and um, unwashed were no longer can no longer be used on eBay. So now it seems that the new word for that is bitter. Yaps is a, 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 a substance that we became aware of earlier this year when we had uh, an adolescent with a history of opioid use disorder was admitted to the hospital who had accidentally overdosed on Yaps. He was unable to locate his opioid of choice and purchased these pills from somebody uh, and he ended up um, in the hospital and, and admitted to what he was taking. He, we don't have a lot of information on this case other than he ended up needing to be intubated and there was a difficult wean due to agitation. YAPS is a pill that contains a combination of heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, and MDMA. Uh, the, this particular patient was from Beloit. It, it may also be sold as Rolo and, and might be represented as being ecstasy or MDMA. Uh, any other, I, I, I tried doing a, a Google search and couldn't find any further information on that. One of the last topics I want to talk about is the volatiles or inhalants. Over a thousand products have been identified that could be uh, misused, including gasoline, nitrous oxide, air duster, spray paint, typewriter, correction fluid. And I have a picture of some of those substances, also hairspray, furniture polish, Sharpie pens. The, some of the street names include uh, whippets, which is often a term for nitrous oxide, huffing, bagging, gassing, and hippie crack, which we'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes here. Nitrous oxide is, is easily available. You can buy it on Amazon. These are com these these have a commercial use where they're used in restaurants as a propellant for um, whipped cream, uh, and you can easily buy them. There's no age restriction on it. Uh, I put this slide in just for Susan. Uh, this is the cover of the Grateful Dead's 1969 album Oxo Oxo. And I put this on here because when I was looking more into the volatiles and inhalants and reading about nitrous oxide, 
in the late 60s, early 70s, before the widespread use of hallucinogens like LSD, um, nitrous oxide was uh, commonly misused. And there were, are reports of the Grateful Dead uh, traveling with tanks of nitrous oxide. And there are um, uh, there's a couple of articles out there how during the recording of this album, the Grateful Dead had tanks of nitrous oxide uh, in their studio. And this is this is this refers to hippie crack. Uh, hippie crack is balloons of nitrous oxide that are sold outside of uh, concerts. These are some concert goers at a fish concert. So the volatiles and the inhalants, uh, as I said, there's a, there's about a thousand different products that could be misused in this category. And because of that, the exact action of each of those is unclear. The most recent uh, evidence I could find is that there is some enhancement of the GABA A receptor and antagonism of the uh, NMDA receptor. Inhalants are often among the first drugs that, that young people use. About one in five kids report having used inhalants by the age of, uh, by, the, by the eighth grade, which means they could have been used a lot younger than that. Uh, it's also one of the few substances used more by younger children than older ones. Same with dextromethorphan, uh, inhalants, um, solvents, gasoline, uh, spray paint, all of those are readily available, air duster. The monitoring the future study in 2020 uh, showed that for eighth graders, about 12.5% had used at least once in their lifetime and 6.1% in the last year. As as they get older, the, the, the prevalence uh, generally goes down. Inhalants however, are a true gateway drug. And there are several studies that show a clear progression from early inhalant use to later use of cocaine, heroin, and uh, IV drug use. In fact, there's a five to nine fold uh, increase. I think one of the ways that this changes my practice in, in seeing younger people is to, to make sure that I ask them about uh, cough medicine, uh, over-the-counter substances and inhalants and volatiles. And I, I think that's something that's kind of fallen off my radar over the years as a family practitioner. Signs of inhalant use include uh, paint, uh, paint stains on the body or clothing. I saw pictures on the internet of people who, uh, adolescents, young people who had uh, died with uh, a spray paint around their mouth, uh, sores or spots around around the nose, uh, chemical breath odor, nausea, loss of appetite. Their clothing may smell of solvent. There might be uh, empty adhesive tubes or other containers. Uh, they might use a potato chip bag uh, to uh, concentrate the inhalant. There might be rags that are soaked in gasoline or solvents, cigarette lighter refills, uh, and aerosol spray cans are, can often be found. Small doses of inhalants lead to uh, euphoria and ataxia similar to alcohol intoxication. Small doses may also induce delusion or hallucinations. Higher doses can produce life-threatening a seizure and coma. There will also be direct cardiac and central nervous system toxicity. Death may come indirectly from asphyxiation, from vomitus, uh, uh, you know, lose consciousness or losing consciousness with the inhalation device or concentrator over your face. Laboratory identification is rarely helpful because the inhalants are so rapidly eliminated. However, there may be tests available for some solvents, such as uh, toluene and benzene. Treatment of overdose is supportive. Mechanical ventilation may be necessary due to direct uh, lung injury. 
There's also a syndrome associated with inhalant use called sudden sniffing death syndrome. Sudden sniffing death syndrome is direct cardiac toxicity, cardiotoxicity causing uh, arrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias, which can lead to fatal heart failure. Sudden sniffing death syndrome is uh, particularly associated with butane, propane, and other chemicals and aerosols. And about 22% of, of those who had died from sudden sniffing death syndrome had no history of previous inhalant use. They, they were first time users. In 2007, I found a case report of using lamotrigine for the treatment of inhalant misuse or volatile substance abuse. However, there was a Cochrane review in 2010 which showed no studies were available to draw uh, conclusions on treatment. Uh, okay, so the last substance for today. We don't, we don't, we, I can't see people. So um, I don't know if anybody recognizes or has seen this before or what this is. Uh, what you're seeing on the left side of the screen is some decomposing or, uh, or bacterial laden meat. And the guy on the right side is eating that decomposed, is eating decomposed meat. And this is something called high meat, and it's the practice of eating decomposed or fermented animal meat. And people who consume this product uh, claim that it causes euphoria. That you can find videos on YouTube for this. This is something new that I just came across uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, there are some, there are plenty of, of stories in the lay press about this, videos on YouTube, but I have found uh, no published uh, papers as of yet. 